Welcome to Experience Means Business, a podcast by Adobe Professional Services. Hello and welcome to our Experience Means Business podcast by Adobe Professional Services. I'm your host, Elliot Wiener, part of the services marketing team here at Adobe. And I'm really excited today. One, it's our first podcast of the new year. So happy new year, everybody. Uh, and two, I'm joined by some of my most amazing colleagues, Ash King and Jason Dossey, who I know very well, but we don't know if the rest of the audience here might know. So let's do a little quick round of introductions. Uh, Ash. I'm Ash King. I'm a manager of AI consulting for Adobe Professional Services. I've been at Adobe for eight years, just a little bit uh, longer than eight. So my lucky eight year here. Um, I've been working with AI technologies and practical applications for much longer than I've been in Adobe. So it's exciting to, you know, after leading content practice, commerce practice, uh, even digital media, to come back to something that I'm super passionate about. So glad to be here. You've worn many hats here at Adobe, Ash, and I've seen almost all of them, I think, but you might have a few more in the closet. We'll see. Uh, and then another great colleague, Jason. Go ahead and introduce. Yeah, it, it, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of a self, uh, self-proclaimed self nerd, uh, but generally I've been in Adobe for about six years, uh, mostly in the AEM space, right? So I manage the uh, a, a number of different AEM experts that help our customers realize value from our AEM technology. And when Gen AI started to to really pick up and it was surrounding the content supply chain, you know, I'd like my nerd, uh, my nerd just kind of wanted to jump in. So, you know, partnering with Ash and other team members in Adobe really to, to define what the Gen AI means to our customers, helping our customers realize the value and, and get a lot of the early adopters that are looking to invest into Gen AI uh, up and running with with our tech. So definitely super exciting times. I'm, I'm looking forward to every day now because it's changing so rapidly. And I love talking to customers about all the great things they can do with the technology. Awesome. And I think Gen AI, right? I think I heard that at least uh, two dozen times right there in that uh, introduction. So, you know, Gen AI obviously has taken off in 2023. Uh, I like to call 2023 kind of the year of familiarity with Gen AI for some of our customers. Um, but a few of our customers might not be up to speed on all the amazing terms and what's going on in the industry and in the landscape. So, you know, Jason, I know we have a lot of different acronyms here in Adobe, and there's a lot of industry acronyms around artificial intelligence and general artificial intelligence. That's what Gen AI is, right? But you know, Jason, could you help us demystify some of these acronyms uh, and ask, just kind of chime in on, you know, what we're using here at Adobe and how it's applicable to different customers? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Gen, uh, Gen AI obviously stands for generative AI, and it's not new. It's been around for a very long time. You know, it's evolved from AI, which is artificial intelligence, and, and ML, which is uh, ma- uh, machine learning, right? So as, as evolution has been going on, uh, you know, behind the scenes, generative AI have been, has been really kind of driving the, the envelope for value. And we saw it probably about, what, a year ago when, when ChatGPT came out. And really the, the first time that that was, that was around was because it was natural language, right? It was regular people talking to uh, gen AI capability and getting results back. And it was really exciting. And I think that uh, kind of drove this re- revolution that we're seeing today. Uh, and because of that, right, because it's been it, it's been around for a long time, there is a lot of acronyms. There's a lot of uh, what I would consider a big monolithic box of Gen AI, and there's a bunch of stuff in it. So Ash and I have been a, a, on, a, on a, a, a big campaign to educate our customers so that way we can demystify it. So that way a normal user can go in and really gain the benefit of using generative AI. Uh, so a couple of things that I, I always hear, right, uh, and then customers are, are, are always asking, you know, about acronyms, right? So LLM is a big one, and this is you know we see that because of ChatGPT uh, and and that 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 capability, which all LLM means is a large language model, right? So that's it's one that very often people like hey, that's big. It's it's I, I don't understand that it's 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 it's, it's scary, but it really is really not, right? Uh, it, it's something that it's approachable um, by most users. Uh, and Ash is and his team has been working with LLMs probably what Ash a couple of years now at this point. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, with large language models, I think one of the things that uh, people always wonder about is, is this intelligent? Is it, is it going to you know, take over the world? And I do believe that there is a, a large amount of risk that we need to mitigate as these technologies get 
you know, more advanced over time. But essentially, a large language model uses a mechanism that's called attention. Simply put, it's able to read your words and figure out what you're trying to say, what your intent is, and then be able to take a large set of data, that uh, training set, and pull together a response, essentially predicting the next word as it goes forward. Really, it's a lot like what we're doing right now, trying to have another word to say uh, on this podcast. So it becomes very powerful in terms of taking all of this data that comes from places like you know, Twitter or Wikipedia, or as has been in the, the headlines, New York Times and other uh, sources of data, taking these large language models, pulling together and synthesizing new outputs. But I think instead of just thinking about it in terms of putting out text, like maybe we're thinking about with ChatGPT, the most powerful aspect of a large language model is the ability for it to understand how to put together processes, workflows, orchestrating elements of an application to drive large layers of efficiency. You know, we were all from the background of creating these big web applications and backends, and there's so much work that has to go into it. And as you're putting that work in, you're kind of predicting the future of the interactions and how people are going to use those applications. When you start to infuse generative AI into these applications, especially when you're driving insights and pulling those insights back into the application, it's more adaptable. It can uh, actually open up exponential pathways to create new experiences and new applications. So I just am very excited about moving beyond chat GPT, moving beyond kind of creating your fanfic and <laughs> using prompts and moving into really impactful experiences driven on top of large language models. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting, Ash, as you were talking, right? So uh, one of the big things, you know, to prediction, right? So Ash and I have been working together for a long time, right? And I train myself to kind of understand and think and, and predict what Ash is going to say. Because these models don't know right off the bat, right? So, you know, I've been working with Ash, so I've been training myself. There's, there's this notion of train your own model, right? Um, it's basically telling and training the model to predict what you want it to predict to, to your business, right? And and this goes across both large language models. And it's something that, Ash, I would love for you to talk about is the diffu diffusion model and how that plays into into basically the the whole Gen AI uh, space. So y just a little bit on that, right? Can you talk about the diffusion model, what we're seeing our customers leveraging that for? Yeah, diffusion models, you know, of course, Adobe's Firefly, but a lot of people are familiar with Stable Diffusion, Dolly, MidJourney, all of these other... Uh, kind of uh, different diffusion models that have different strengths uh, and abilities to create imagery. Adobe's approach with a diffusion model is essentially instead of like a large language model having large sets of text data from disparate sources, um, unlike the other diffusion models out there, Adobe has taken its stock library, or Adobe stock, as well as other licensed sources and has used those in the training sets to create a brand safe, commercially safe set of capabilities where you can create imagery and uh, be assured that you're not infringing upon somebody else's IP rights. So much so that Adobe is willing to indemnify uh, these outputs. But one of the great things about the, uh, the data sets themselves and the fact that we can attribute the ownership of the data is that we can also help these artists and photographers and 3D artists that have created these uh, this content and help them participate in some of the success of, of the model itself. One thing that is a caveat, though, is compared to Stable Diffusion, MidJourney, etc., a brand is not going to get their own IP out of this model because we intentionally focused on protecting IP. We don't ingest it, even if it, we're exposed to it, or if there's a prompt that creates something similar. So if a customer wants to utilize the model, they can create a custom model extension with us by taking their brand uh, IP, ingesting it into the model, and defining how it's going to be used, whether it's a photographic style, other content like objects, or characters even. 
and be able to pull those into the model. And now they have the ability to not only use Gen AI to create new imagery, whether it be ideation or derivative works or variations, but also to be able to build that on top of the existing imagery that's capable with the Firefly model. So now you're able to create sophisticated backgrounds and place your product in that scene with a photo- photographic style that you've already defined. So I think that in terms of this approach and the fact that you can tie these custom model extensions into the entire Adobe ecosystem, whether it be Photoshop or Express or even assets and sites and HAL, this is a really killer way to get value out of generative AI. Yeah, and, and as you said, a bunch of things that I think what, which is to me what ex- it's exciting our customers, right? So now we have we have a uh, you know a world that's looking for hyper personalization. They want to see you know things that speak to them at the time that they're visiting the properties that our our, our customers are putting out, or they're you know our you, you people that are listening here, your customers. And now we have this great thing where we can do language, we can do we can do imagery, and now it's brand safe. It is on uh, it is commercially safe. It's embedded in our apps, and this is this storm that we're seeing is really why. A lot of customers are coming in and we're talking to on a day-to-day basis where not only you're gaining the efficiencies that generative AI will bring, but now you're getting real results, real customer results, because now we're hyper-personalizing every experience that we're able to, to engage with our customers on. And as we know, uh, every digital experience right now is a battleground, right? We're battling for attention. We're battling for market share. We're battling for all these things. And Gen AI is really being that, that tool to help us scale at a lot faster and, and, and a faster rate. Uh, we're seeing early adopters across every vertical and organization that we're talking to. Um, now, obviously, you know, new technology, there's things that we have to consider, right, uh, of will this work in in this use case? Will it work in this application? Will it work in, you know, this customer journey, right? So, we, we, obviously, we hit some walls. Ash, you've been working with a lot of customers. Can you share a few of those walls that that you've seen customers hit so that way our viewers that we're we're talking to now can avoid some of those pitfalls? I, I'm glad you brought that up, Jason. Um, and I, I think that you and I both have bruises hitting those walls. <laughs> uh, but let's talk about a few of them. I think one of the first ones is not having the right stakeholders involved. So a lot of customers are experimenting in pockets, or there's a MarTech owner who wants to move into a new generative AI use case. I think it's really important to be able to pull not just the MarTech owner or the marketers, but also the creative teams. Think about the IT teams, the legal and security teams, and make sure that, first of all, they're aligned with even moving into generative AI, that they have um, a, an ethics committee, a mindset, uh, some standards around that that we can work with and make sure that we're informing and also moving forward. And once we have that group together, we have to kind of level set and demystify what are some of the capabilities. And Toby's approach is a little different than uh, other vendors in that we have all of these capabilities that can be driven using the tools in the experience cloud and the creative cloud, and even the document cloud, to not just enter a prompt and get a result, but to drive a workflow, to actually have humans in the loop, to get consistent results moving forward. So being able to pull those stakeholders together and looking at a use case and determining how are we going to interact with this? How are we going to think about review and brand safety? How are we going to think about the life cycle of the models in this application over time? Um, and had then taking that group and that use case and bringing together elements to prove exactly how the model is going to operate. We call that a proof point. Jason, you're, you're great at helping refine and get to that proof point. Um, like, what are some of the things that you've seen with customers that, that were, we had to get over to get to that proof point? Maybe you can talk about what it is. Yeah, you know, and as, as I talk to customers, I always say, you know, especially with any technology, but Gen AI specifically, is to expect the unexpected. Uh, some good, some bad, right? So, and the proof point helps us to, to get there faster, right? Um, so a few things that we've seen from our proof points perspective is when you think of a proof point, it's the smallest atomic scale thing that we can do to prove out that this will work for a customer. And that may be as simple as 
we want to generate some on-brand background so that way we can put our employees' pictures on, right? So that way you see my face, my image uh, with an Adobe background, and that way I can put it on my badge. And as you think about that and you scale that up, uh, you scale it up to hundreds of thousands of employees, that is a real value that we can, we can, we can show off. But the first, first step is, can we make it a background that our, 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 our user will like? You know, that's, that's one. A few others that I, I tend to see is uh, when you start to think about tagging an asset uh, within uh, either your asset management or your damn tools, it's very important uh, when you think about a human, right, that they're looking at and thinking of how is my customer or how is my user going to use this asset so that way they can tag it appropriately. That takes a lot of time. When you think about uh, most of all the assets that you as a listener interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, that's a lot. Like, you know, I think of music because that's my, my part, right? I have genres, I have some genres, I got to tag them appropriately. What time of the day I like listening to it? Like all of those things, it takes a lot of time. Uh, we're starting to see a lot of customers seeing if Jenny and I can tag it so that way we can uh, augment human to do it, right? So that way, uh, if you're a grocery store, if you, you're selling products, can we say, hey, this is a vegetarian option when I see uh, something that's vegetarian, right? So that's a small proof point of saying, can we identify this to make it more useful for our users without having to spend lots and lots of time uh, with a human tagging these things, right? So those are a few ones that, that I've seen uh, quite recently. Uh, and then there's some just really fun ones that, I, that I've been looking at of uh, generating, to, to Ash's point, the embeds, it, it like embedded in our applications, right? Can I make content uh, more personalized, uh, the right tone of voice, uh, and that, that's another really good proof point that we've seen a lot of customers start to start to use. Now, yeah, that's that's important. Yeah. Uh, just interjecting there, I, you you raise a very important point. Uh, creatives, marketers working together to make sure that all the content is on brand and that nobody's feeling like the democratization, creating variations of this content is going to erode the brand. I uh, just. The example I got from what creative director was, I don't want the sales guy typing in a prompt and creating something for a deck. <laughs> I want to be able to, to drive that process forward. So I, I just wanted to interject about that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then I think that goes back to getting the right people involved early on, right? It, this is not, not, a, not a Gen AI for, for Jason. It's a Gen AI for all. And, and you have to think about that when you start to, when you want to start, right? Because really, that's the hardest step is, is where to start. How do I start? Um, especially if you're just hearing about Gen AI and you're starting to see this being embedded in apps, it's, it's, it's a little scary. It's a little daunting of where do I even start at, right? Uh, and then what value on the other side is it going to bring? Because it's, it's very easy to think of, of Gen AI of, hey, I'm going to save time by not doing this thing that this computer can do for me. But it's so much more than that. And then we're seeing a lot of much higher value use cases coming out of Gen AI. Um, so, you know, I know one customer that we're, we're working with now, you know, there's a time savings when you think about uh, doing some, you know, very basic stuff with, with Firefly and diffusion models and then our large language models. But there's, uh, there's, real, uh, there's real human factors that are, have value to it. Like, so, you know, I had mentioned earlier about just having a background uh, of my face and, and I'm putting on my, my badge. That's a really cool use case, but there's so much more value when you think about uh, scaling that out uh, across the organization and dehumanizing uh, or humanizing the experience, right? So that way, you know, you're not just a number in your company book, right? There is actually a human on the other side of it. So that way uh, you're actually, in, you know, in propping up your employees, right? So that's just one, uh, you know, hidden value there. So there's some additional hidden values that, Ashley, you're probably seeing as well as you're, as you're deploying this out. Uh, can you talk a little bit about a couple of the ones that you've seen? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I like to think of it as the old uh, adage of, would you like to, at the end of the month, have me give you a check for $1,000? Or would you like me to put a penny on each square of this check chessboard and double it over time? And that's really where I think a lot of the unlock comes from. When companies are looking at it from the standpoint of not just efficiency, but, oh, wow, I'm going to save time here, and I'm going to be able to unlock these resources here. How do I put that penny on top of another one and just continue to double the ability to create these exponential experiences. So I, I think that once people see a proof point or they start to get the conversation together with both the creative and marketing teams, uh, and maybe they haven't even seen the floor that each one of them works on for like years. Now they're having a conversation. Suddenly there's this unlock of possibilities 
you know, of these campaigns that could never have been done before of one-to-one personalization from, you know, assembled set of reviewed content that each user can resonate with and that never gets stale over a journey. There's just so much that people can be thinking about once they are freed from the mindset of the everyday, the busy, and the, the, the kind of tools that they've been able to access in the past. That's exciting for me. It's almost like a light goes on in people's minds and in their eyes. So that's what drives me forward. It's just unlocking that excitement and that passion that all of us have felt at some time in our careers. And this is the the point where people just feel it again. And I'm excited for the future. And I love hearing you guys talk about this because it's not just the technology, right? I hear it's human centric, keeping humans in the loop, right? Making sure that we are making choices that are applicable to the business and that humans and people are in control and command of those choices, right? So, you know, that adoption and that momentum bit, Ash, that you're describing, how do you start to evangelize that even further into the organization as you start to prove out these proof points and perhaps overcome some of that trepidation or uh, fear of the unknown? Yeah, it's, uh, it's all about show, don't tell, uh, really, when it comes down to it. But, uh, you know, there's also the idea that uh, everybody needs to feel empowered for the future, including uh, taking the reins around brand safety and ethics. I, I like to use the, the Tesla uh, metaphor. People come to Adobe because of the reputation that we have for the safety of our Firefly model. But just like a Tesla, you're not going to put it on autopilot and go to sleep. There's a partnership that we have working together. So part of that is not just having the proof point or other uh, solutions to show other teams within an organization, but also show them how it works, how it changes their process, how it connects the teams together to get there. And I think it's that that uh, kind of incremental, that iterative uh, you know, process of getting other teams together, creating other use cases, connecting those teams that starts to uncover almost like picking up a rock and finding other rocks underneath it. All of the other hindrances that need to be either removed or discussed uh, or modified to help drive adoption across an enterprise. So really thinking that iterative uh, way helps enterprises move forward rather than trying to sketch out a big picture and walk backwards to it. Like Jason said, you got to show what the model is going to do. You got to prove it. And then from there, you can build upon those use cases. Wonderful. And we're going to build upon this story in our next episode when we talk about how we actually enable customers to do this and where they can start this AI journey. Uh, So gentlemen, we're at time. Thank you so much for participating here today. I know that Jason, you said you're a music fan. I know Ash is a music fan. So am I hearing you correctly? I'm not going to be able to train a model on Taylor Swift because I didn't buy the tickets for my kids. And no, nope. don't mess with Taylor Swift. <laughs> I'm warning. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, uh, we'll close it out. Thank you all so much for joining Ash and Jason. Uh, thank you all for listening or tuning in. Please stay tuned for our next episode where we talk about how we get customers started on this wonderful AI journey. So for now, I'm Elliot Wiener from Adobe Professional Services, signing off. We'll see you next time. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Let us know what you think by writing to us at infoacs at adobe.com. See you later for more.